Hey, everybody. The conference is coming. The conference is coming. Our first ever Producers Perspective Super Conference, Saturday, November 11th, Sunday, November 12th. Tons and tons of Broadway superpowers all there to tell you their stories about how they made it and how you can too. Go to the producersperspective.com, register today. We will see you there. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Podcast. My name is Ken Davenport. I'm excited to have you here, and I'm excited to have my guest here today, book writer, screenwriter, and rock musician (laughs) as well. Please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Kyle Jarrell. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you, man. It's a pleasure to be here. So Kyle's the author of what was the very controversial, a very merry, unauthorized children's Scientology pageant back in 2004, directed by Alex Timbers, who has been on this podcast. Frequent collaborator with the very hip Duncan Sheik, who's also been on this podcast. He's written for film, TV, and he has a show that is premiering right now on the CW network, Valor, right? That's correct. It's on Monday nights. It's uh, at 9, 8 central on the CW. So, and he's also a singer, songwriter for the rock band Sky Pony. <laughs> That's true. And the book writer for this season's upcoming SpongeBob the Musical. So, Kyle, from Sky Pony to SpongeBob. <laughs> Quite a journey for you. Yeah, you know, I've been a fan of Spongebob for a long time. I will admit I got into it in college, watched it with my roommates, late night sessions, and uh, when I heard they were developing a musical, this was about five years ago, and they were looking for a book writer, I was very interested uh, in throwing my hat into the mix and was lucky enough to get hired by Nickelodeon and, and Tina Landau, who's the director. She'd been hired before, so she was part of that hiring process, and it's been an awesome ride, and we're stoked to be coming to Broadway. I will say the similarity to Sky Pony is both are, you know, Sky Pony, we try to do visually arresting, sort of flamboyant in the sense of being like bright colors, crazy theatrics. That's kind of what we try to bring visually to our shows. And SpongeBob has very much the same aesthetic. David Zinn is the costume and set designer, and he's created this crazy, colorful, incredibly creative, wild world on stage. So there's a little bit of shared DNA. Yeah. So actually, you mentioned something that we've never really talked about here on the podcast, which is the hiring process for a book writer. Sure. Because shows come together in so many different ways, and often it's just a bunch of writers being like, hey, let's write a musical about Starbucks cups, which is (laughs) what's sitting on my desk right now, which is why I mentioned that. But obviously something like SpongeBob, which is a major brand, there's a major corporation behind it, and they're going to hire a book writer. So tell me what that process was like. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Most of my experiences have been the first version, which is like getting together with a bunch of writers or another writer saying, let's come up with an idea. But yeah, in this case, Nickelodeon had decided that they were interested in pursuing the idea of a Spongebob musical. They weren't even committed to doing it. Very corporate. Very yeah, cor- we, we don't know yet. We're just exploring. You know what? It is corporate, but I have to say it's also really smart because I, I think, from what I've heard, some other corporations have rushed processes where they've said, we're going to have X musical on Broadway next season, and they rush the creative process, and sometimes that can result in not the greatest you know, creative material. Nickelodeon basically said, we're going to explore this idea. We're going to have various steps to the process. And in each step, we're going to evaluate, is this worth doing? Is this a step forward for the brand? That's their corporate speak. For me and Tina, each step was, is this working? And can it work better? And I think, you know, having that sort of a process was very helpful. Anyway, back to the hiring. Yeah, you know, I think in this process, what they did is they reached out to various agents and said, hey, we're developing this. Are there folks who you'd like to submit? I think there was some familiarity with my work. So they had reached out to CAA. I think they had mentioned my name. CAA, my agency, called me and said, hey, are you interested in this? I said, totally, this sounds bonkers and awesome. I heard that Tina was attached, which made it sound even more bonkers and even more awesome. They shared some samples, whatever. We set up a meeting. And to be honest, it was quite a process. I think I first met with Tina and Susan Vargo. Susan's the producer for Nickelodeon. I think we met a couple of times. We talked in generalities. I didn't pitch any stories or anything at that point. Then I had to meet with a whole bunch of executives at Nickelodeon. And then they hired me to write a treatment. So just to you know, basically work with Tina, pitch a story, and then sort of beat out the story and where the songs go. And then only after that did they say, okay, you're the book writer. So, you know, 
Was that a frustrating process? Sometimes. But do I understand why they wanted to pursue it in that step kind of fashion? Totally. And they paid me for each step, so no complaints there. And somehow I made it through the gauntlet, and here we are. Well, congratulations. Now, you've obviously pitched and sold and made TV, film, etc. Is it, was it similar process to that? It kind of was, actually. Yeah, just basically going into a room and pitching yourself and pitching your ideas. Yeah, actually very similar. So when did you start writing in general? When did it begin for you? I mean, were you two years old and were you popping stuff out? And, and... No, you know, I, I was a, an actor as a kid. I did a, I grew up in Ithaca, New York. There's a great theater there called the Hangar Theater. You probably have heard yeah, of Yeah, sure. So I did a lot of plays there when I was a kid. And I did a couple like student films at Ithaca College and stuff. And then I got to be about like 13 and my voice started to change, but I still looked like I was like... 11 years old. So basically I wasn't castable because I was kind of this like freaky, like what age is that kid? So I suddenly wasn't doing that anymore, but I kind of caught the bug. And that was when I started writing stuff. And The Hanger had this awesome um, young playwriting competition for local kids. And I entered that and I placed. And as part of it, they did a night where they would perform, I think, six of these short plays written by kids. And that was the first time I saw one of my plays performed. And I was totally hooked. And that was the focus instead of acting from that point on. Yeah, You are the second podcast guest in like a month to say they got their start from a young playwriting competition. Jonathan Rand, same thing. Oh, wow. I think it's huge. I really do. And uh, there's a lot all over the country. And yeah, I think to give a kid... the th- You know what it is? If you want to write short stories, that is something you just do a lot. But theater is a collaborative process. And if you can't get anyone to produce your work, I think it's tough to really understand what that art form is. And so these young playwright competitions allow kids to get that collaborative part of the process. And I think that's super key. So what I love talking about to people like you about is you write in so many different mediums. You write television, small screen, you like big screen. You just write try to make a living, man. The Williamsburg. <laughs> rock clubs Um, (laughs) but you're also writing for the theater so for you what makes an idea a theater idea versus a small screen idea versus a big screen that is a great question and you're totally right different ideas i think do tell you what they want to be you know it's i think it's easier to say tv and film what make those separate a film idea needs to be a closed loop right? It needs to have a clear beginning, middle, and an end. And you need to be able to tell that within, you know, two hours. A TV idea, I think, needs to be more like a novel. You set up characters, you set up a situation that can, you know, propel those characters for a long period of time. And then it's ultimately about uncovering character and using that scenario as sort of the story engine to push you forward. When it comes to theater, I think generally... I look for ideas that are a little bit more like film that can be a closed loop with a clear beginning, middle, and end within an evening. But I also think that for theater, you want something that has an innate theatricality to it, something that justifies why I'm going to get off of my couch where I could watch Netflix and go to the theater. So I guess I would say aliveness. You know, there's something in the idea that justifies aliveness to it. Music is a huge thing because live music just has a power to it that I think is really infectious. I mean, people will go to rock concerts for that reason. But I also think, you know, there's an immersiveness that theater can offer, even theater that's not traditionally immersive theater, that I think also justifies a piece being theatrical. So I would say that when I'm thinking about what idea is going to be a theater piece, it's something that is demanding aliveness or a little bit of an immersiveness, that sort of spontaneous feeling to it. So in in the case of SpongeBob, it's a good question because, you know, SpongeBob has this very rich history on screen. So why should it be on stage? Like, that was a big question that both Tina and I asked ourselves and Nickelodeon asked, like, how are we going to justify doing it on stage? And the answer that really Tina cracked was um, it needs to explode out from the stage. It needs to feel like a rock concert concert meets a carnival meets a musical and really pull the audience in and have a really live theatrical excitement that you couldn't get from sitting at home watching. And the process for each, how for you personally, the process for writing book versus writing a pilot versus writing screenplay, how does it differ for you as a writer? Well, I would say the biggest difference with a musical is that a couple of times I've done things where I've written the book and, and the music and the lyrics. 
But in those processes that that is not the case, what's very different is that it is a very collaborative process from moment one. If I'm not writing the songs, if I'm just writing the book, there is this back and forth that happens with the songwriter, right? Or songwriters in the case of SpongeBob. They give me material. I'm like, oh, this is not exactly how I imagined this song, but it's kind of cooler than I imagined it. But in order to set up that song, now the book has to adjust. So there's kind of a back and forth hyper collaborative writing process at least when it comes to musical theater whereas film and tv i've generally written alone so although there's certainly a collaborative process in the making of it generally the writing is me alone in a room just sort of working in my own head and then responding to notes that i get but it's not a give and take with written material so that's a big difference i also would say the speed is very different you know, the Spongebob musical, I've been involved for about five years. I think Tina was involved about two or three years before that. A lot of musicals, as you know, take even longer to gestate. And I think part of that is because it is this tricky art form where you've got to get the music and the book to work together. And it is a process of different departments talking and working. Film and television tends to be quicker. Not always with film, almost always with TV. My TV show, I started writing the first episode about a year ago. So like last November. And we're now shooting episode 10. So that's all happened within a year. So there really is a speed difference. And I think that does impact the way you work, or at least the way that I work, which is I need to be... I need to spit it all out really fast and then revise heavily. That's definitely how I approach television writing. And when it comes to stage where you have more time, it tends to be a little bit more of a deliberate writing process for me. That makes sense. Speaking of the music in SpongeBob, you have a very unique situation in this in this musical in that the score is being written by multiple composers yeah. and lyricists. Right, yeah, and these major, major rock stars. Yeah, we got lucky. We got a lot of. I mean, we have Aerosmith, we have uh, Cindy Lauper, we have Sarah Bareilles, we have Ti, John Legend, Flaming Lips. I mean, the list is awesome. So, talk to me a little bit about the pros of that, and also the cons <laughs> and the challenges of how you deal with different voices and different ideas. And, and for you, you're the you're the one foundation. You're the center of the wheel, if you will, pulling <laughs> yeah. all these different. I mean, Aerosmith and Sarah Bareilles very different styles and how do you yeah i mean you know honestly i would say that i'm not the only center of the wheel i'd sort of say the center of the wheel is tom kitt who's our music supervisor and who did the arrangements of the songs so he had a really tough challenge which is how do you take these very different styles of music and make them feel similar enough that it sounds like a score but also preserve the unique sounds that these different people have so to be honest, that is, I think, the hardest job. And he, as you know, total genius and totally rocked it. In the writing process, you know, I actually think it was all upside. I was worried because the truth is like Flaming Lips, John Legend, T.I., they were not sitting in the room with Tina and I. Shocking. Right? So a lot, because they're also only writing one song each, right? And they're very busy people. So it was really, a, a you know, remote back and forth. And, and sometimes through a manager, sometimes not even directly with the artist. In many cases, directly with the artist. And I was a little concerned going in that that would mean that we would get stuff that was totally off base and then it would be awkward because we'd have to go back and ask people to change it. But what we ended up doing is uh, I had a very detailed treatment of the show that really showed which each song needed to accomplish in the story. And we gave that to the artists. In some cases, we also gave them the scene going in and out of it. And we're very clear. We even gave, in many cases, like lyrical prompts. Here's like a metaphor that seems like it could be the center of this song. We basically loaded them up with information. And it turned out that that process worked pretty well. I mean, they're great songwriters. I think that's why. But in basically every case, we got back a song that was really close. And then there was a bit of a back and forth notes process. But I mean, people really nailed it. And I, th I think they kind of enjoyed especially for pop songwriters who are often just writing, on, they, all they have is a blank page, they can write a song about anything. I think they really liked getting a really clear brief. Like, this is what we need this to be. It let them write really quickly. So, like I said, it's kind of all been upside because we've gotten these amazing songs from these great people who, frankly, we probably couldn't have convinced to do a whole score because they're too busy. And instead, they just each write us one super awesome song. So the things I were worried about actually did not 
really happen? And frankly, almost everyone that we approached said yes, too. And again, I think that's because it was a small ask. It was, hey, one song. And also a lot of people are SpongeBob fans. You'd be surprised. Like a lot of these artists, we were like, I don't know, let's take a swing. And then found out like, oh, they're a huge SpongeBob fan or they have a kid who's a huge SpongeBob fan. Yeah, I think it's kind of a great way to do a show for a certain kind of show, which SpongeBob certainly is, which, you know, which can be a little eclectic and, and, you know, and can sustain that difference in style. I think it's an awesome way to work. So you're obviously a musician yourself. How does that help you when you're writing book? Like, what do you like? Oh, you, you understand the mechanics of, of a song. Should all book writers and writers <laughs> of musicals out there be like, I got to join a rock band on the weekend so I can develop my book writing craft. I mean, I think it does help. It helps me. You know, I, I'm not going to give anyone else any advice, but it does help me to have a little bit of understanding because part of your job as the book writer, I think, is to set up an emotion that is either going to lead you naturally into the song or be at contrast with the song, sort of whatever you need it to be. But you're you're creating a place for the song to live with the story. And I think understanding musically how the song is working, tempo-wise, mood-wise, all that stuff is really helpful. I also think a big thing in a lot of musicals is how you get into songs. You know, is there a little bit of underscoring that brings you into a song? Is there a little bit of dialogue that happens over that underscoring? That stuff's really important. And getting it right, I think, can really make a song work or not work. And I think just having an understanding of musicality is helpful with that. The other thing I will say, and I know you know this well, one of the bummers about musical theater is generally you're just with the piano in the rehearsal room and you're not hearing the full orchestrations until you get into tech, frankly. And so I think being able to hear a piano reduction of the score and being able to imagine what it's going to sound like fuller at least for me, lets me do a better job as book writer. Because then I feel less surprised when I get into tech and the songs are fully orchestrated. I'd say that's probably the biggest way that it's been helpful to me, is just being able to sort of talk to a composer, they describe what they're imagining, and then I can I at least know enough about music to imagine that. I think that's been very helpful. Let's go back to the beginning of your career in Scientology pageant. <laughs> And tell me a little bit of how that came about. Gosh, Alex Timbers and I had done another show before that at Here Art Center, and we were looking for a follow-up to do. And I, I was a religious studies major in college and had always been really interested in, in cults. And I think Alex had just had like a weird obsession with Scientology for some reason. So we sort of realized we met at that we, we had a shared interest there. And at the time, Scientology was really in the news. And, you know, I honestly can't remember if that was when Tom Cruise was jumping on the couch or if it was something before. But it was a news cycle where the weirdness of Hollywood Scientology was really sort of on the national mind. So it just felt like sort of the right time. So we decided to make the show. We did it originally at this place called Tank, which is a theater space that does still exist, but not in the same location. Cast was all children. It was kind of a super crazy idea, but I think it was a hooky enough idea that that it sort of caught people's interest. And, and it also did get you know, did not make the Scientology, the Church of Scientology very happy. And we did get, you know, some threatening letters from them and some things. And then the press found out about that. And it, it, I have to be honest, it's like a really mixed memory for me, because I think that the attention that some of that conflict with the church got certainly helped the show get attention. So, you know, both Alex and I definitely benefited, as did the show and everyone who worked on it, from that controversy. I also, it was very difficult because there are children in the show. And we had worked really hard to be very open with the children and with their parents and talk about, like, this is what the show's about. It's parody. We're trying to talk about, you know, organized religion and some of the challenges that it can bring, you know, because the show is about Scientology, but it's also about people searching for answers and that can sometimes make them easy to take advantage of. But, you know, telling these kids, look, it's not that we're against religion at all. We're just saying it's really a pity when people take take advantage of that. And so we had been, we'd been trying to be so diligent about that. And then when some, you know, when 
for example, this gentleman from the Church of Scientology showed up unannounced at rehearsal where there are all these kids there. I have to say, I felt really responsible and guilty for these kids that they would be exposed to this kind of controversy. So it's a really mixed feeling because I felt bad for those child actors to expose them to that. But on the other hand, it did bring in a lot of audiences and, and brought a lot of attention to the show. Also, I think the show's really good. And so I'm, I'm glad that more people got to see it. But as I said, it, it was a weird, just seeing these kids' faces when like this kind of frankly creepy looking guy, he kind of looked like Willem Dafoe at his creepiest, just sort of showed up unannounced. You know, they were freaked out and I really felt bad about that. So what I, why I really wanted to talk about that, and for those of you interested, Alex talks a lot about it on his podcast, so go listen to that. But what I, what I, I'm interested in is your the first part of your answer you said oh and it was part of the news cycle and then you talked about a big hooky idea and there's a lot of writers out there listening that are looking for their first idea <laughs> and what I love about what you both did and are still doing is the ability to find a really creative unique idea but there's a marketer in you somewhere as well there's a <laughs> business guy that says oh not only do I have a real creative instinct here, but there's something here that the world is paying attention to. How is that a part of your process? You know, I think it is. I have to say, I think Alex is kind of a genius at that. I would say I'm like, okay at that. But props to him. I think that's one of his his greatest skills, frankly, is the ability to sort of sense like what is going to feel zeitgeisty. It's tough. I, I think it is important. You know, there's particularly now so much media out there, so much noise in the world that finding an idea that cuts through is is challenging and important. Right. I'm sure you get like, I can't imagine how many scripts you, you have on, you know, going across your desk every day. And I'm sure that when you're looking at them, one of the things you're asking yourself is, is there a market for this right now? But here's the challenge. When you, it does take time to write stuff, particularly in theater, it takes time to develop stuff. So sometimes if you have an idea that's too topical, by the time it's done, that moment has passed. So it's like this super magic thing to find something that feels zeitgeisty and yet is going to still feel important in like a year or two. Now with Scientology, we had the good luck that we worked really fast. I think we were like five months from conception to first production. But, you know, that that's because it was a company that was like a small downtown company and like, you know, it was a cheap show. Obviously, it doesn't work like that for Broadway, right? There's like no Broadway show in the history of the world, probably, that's been five months from conception to execution. So is it important? Yes. How much would I tell a young writer to stress about it? Not a lot, because I think it's hard to game. I'd say the better advice is if the idea gets you fired up and you can't stop thinking about it, other people probably will be the same. So chase those ideas that feel vital to you. I think that's my best advice on how to sort of skin this particular cat. You work with the variety of people, different types of people, Alex Timbers to Duncan Sheik to Tina to all these very... Does you find your collaborative process has to change with these people? Are you like, oh, this... No, this is the way I do it. This is the way I work. Or how do you shift between collaborators? Oh, man. I mean, I can't speak for anyone else. But for me, it is always different. Every collaboration is different. You know, just f you got to figure out your vibe with a person. You need to figure out how they like to work, how that can meet with how you like to work. And I think it's, it is always different. And part of the fun of a collaboration is feeling that out, you know. But I don't know. I, there probably are people who are like, this is my process my way or the highway, I have found that to not be successful. And almost like any conversation, like you sit down, you get a sense of somebody's like beach patterns, you sort of find your way in the first 10 minutes of any conversation. I think it's like that with a collaboration. You know, the first little while you're feeling each other out, you're figuring out the process. And then I think where it gets awesome is when you lock into whatever your process is going to be in that collaboration. And that's when you really can like start cooking. Your wife is in the theater. She is. She's an actress and a singer. And what's it like both being in the same industry? Man, I don't know, good and hard. She's also in, in my rock band. She's the lead singer. So, and one of the reasons that we wanted to start that project is because we weren't doing, we are in the same industry, but we weren't doing a lot of things together. So we were kind of like, you know, let's make a thing that's our thing so that we can at least sort of get some of our creative juices out, like in the same place. Honestly, just so we could spend some time together, you know, go to rehearsals and whatever. I don't know, man. You know, it's it's tough. It, we're in a weird industry. We often keep weird hours. I say we, including you. And 
I think, look, people I know who are married to someone else who's in the arts or entertainment, that person gets the weirdness of the industry a little bit better, but also has those weird hours, which makes scheduling and logistics and seeing each other and being in the same place really hard sometimes. The people I know who are in the arts, who are with someone who's not, that person often doesn't totally get it and sort of gets frustrated. Like, why do you have to be gone like every night this week? But there's a stability there that's kind of nice. So pros and cons, this is who I fell in love with. You know, we deal with the pros and the cons. It's <laughs> my best answer I can give. You're a really busy guy. So you have, you know, it's, we got, we started this podcast at nine o'clock in the morning because you're on your way to rehearsal. <laughs> Thank you. Bob, you it. have a television show. Any life hacks out there for just keeping it all straight and organized? Oh man, I would love to hear them. <laughs> God, I don't know. I, you know what? I think, and I'm not saying I do this. I try. I'm not saying I'm successful at it. The best life hack that I have found for being super busy is prioritizing in your own head, particularly with regards to communication. By which I mean, we've all got these devices. In our pockets, we're getting emails and texts all the time. I probably, I get like hundreds of emails a day. And I used to feel like I have to read every single one and respond as many as I can immediately. And what I've realized is like, that's not possible. And so I need to be able to prioritize in my head the second I see them. Like, I don't need to worry about that right now. I'll deal with that when I have a second, on the train, whatever. This one I really need to deal with. And letting myself off the hook in terms of the non-essential stuff, I don't know why that's like so hard for me, but it's been really hard. I think that is the best life hack. Really, honestly, we all are busy in that way now, right? Like everybody gets tons of emails. So I'm really trying to do that. Like just be okay with not responding immediately if it doesn't require immediate response. That's the best thing I can say. The other thing is get exercise and sleep. I actually have a friend who's a showrunner and I asked him like, hey, I'm about to go run a show. Like what's your advice? And that's what he said. He said, make sure you sleep enough and exercise. Because it's easy when you have so much to do to just be like, eh, I'll, you know, stay up super late. I won't sleep. And like, I don't have time to go for a run. But those things keep you sane, you know? And whatever that extra hour or two that you're losing in the day, like, it is totally worth it for that sanity. So those are my two pieces of advice. Sleep and exercise and don't respond to every email. Are you a Virgo? I'm a Libra. Okay. Okay, makes sense. I'm, <laughs> I'm the same way with the email. In fact, I started my little life hack for that thing is I ha- have a folder now called Answer Post Business Hours. Oh, wow. I literally take emails that I don't need to get to right away, throw it in a folder, and then on the train. It's so smart. Late in watching TV, I can bang out. Something. That's really smart. Yeah, I you know what I do is I leave them unread in my inbox, which is like... Actually, a little more stressful because then you look at yeah. it and you see how many unread messages you have. Way too anal retentive. I might, st- I might steal that. Steal it, sure. Yeah. It's all yours. <laughs> okay, my last question, which um, we affectionately refer to as my genie question okay. here on the podcast. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit. Okay, you. I thought we were going to go. I dream of genie, but no. the, wow, well, similar. A young guy. Well, I don't know why. Great little man. <laughs> I don't know why. I that. I was surprised to hear that from you, Bob. <laughs> I want you to imagine the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and says, I want to thank you for bringing SpongeBob to Broadway for all the stuff you've done, and I want to grant you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you crazy about Broadway or the theater that that makes you upset, angry? You're such a nice, positive guy that would make you really (laughs) flip up a table and so angry that you'd ask this genie to wish away, that the theater would just be a better place if this were changed. I can tell you exactly what I think it is, and but I, the genie would have to come up with a solution because I, I, I don't know what it is. It is very hard to make a living in the theater at the lower levels. And so for a young person who wants to work in any way in the theater, frankly, particularly writing and directing, though, if you, you either need to have money behind you, like family money, or you need to be working, you know, day job or a bunch of jobs while you're pursuing that. That was my experience. And I think there are people who can't do that. They just don't have the money. They don't have the ability to, you know, at least I had parents who I knew could help me if all fail. Luckily, that never happened. But not everybody has that. And so I think the problem is folks who do not come from backgrounds that are middle class or above sometimes get filtered out of the theater world. Their voices get lost because they frankly can't afford to do those early years where you're working for free or almost nothing. 
And I think that's a real pity in terms of the range and diversity of voices that end up getting represented. So that to me feels like a huge systemic issue in theater. And when I say those first couple of years, like it can be like 10 to 20 years that a lot of people are not making a living off of theater, you know, and that's a really long time. You got to be really committed to doing that for 10 or 20 years. I would love to change that. If there could be some magical grant that people could get that would at least help them through like a year. There are some things like that. I just think it would, that the theater world would benefit so much for the, you know, diversity of voices and viewpoints that would be allowed to rise through the system who right now kind of edit themselves out. It's By the way, it's true in TV and film as well, but I think a little less true because people tend to get paid for development in theater and film more than they do in theater. You know, obviously like a big musical, you do get paid for development steps. But, you know, generally, like if you're doing a reading of a straight play at a theater, you're getting like a hundred bucks. You know what I mean? So I, I think it's a huge issue, to be honest. And I think when you look at, this is the last thing I'll say on my high horse. And by the way, I'm a, a white dude, white straight dude. So I really am sort of part of the problem or not part of the solution here, certainly. But when I look at the seasons of regional theaters and, and stuff like that, there's always been a lot of talk about like, God, all these plays are by like white men, you know? I think that's a problem on the programming side, but I also think it's a problem in this respect that folks who aren't white, generally white and from more affluent backgrounds, a lot of times are in really it's about the affluence more than anything. A lot of times are finding that they just don't think it's worth it to do that slog of those early years in, in theater work where they can't afford to do it. And I think that's a bummer. I think we'd have much more diverse programming across the board if we kind of figured this problem out. It's a real challenge. Go out there, everyone listening, and support a young playwright. Yeah. Listen, everyone should like crowd. I don't know. There's tons of writers out there looking for a little help. Give them a tip on their website. Do something. Or you know what? Or if you run a business or or whatever, you're a theater administrator. Hire a, a young playwright who's not you know white dude from a upper middle class family. Give them a day job, which can help subsidize their writing. You know, that's another way I think to to try to help people. I think it's a great idea. You know what else was a great idea? Them hiring you to write <laughs> I hope musical. So. It really was. I just think, you know, what what could have been what a very commercial idea. Getting you and Tina on board was just such a smart oh, idea. Thanks, so man. I'm very excited to see it. Thanks to you for being here. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you next time. Thanks, man. Don't forget, register for the Super Conference at theproducersperspective.com. Prices go up by a hundred bucks after the 31st of October. Go to theproducersperspective.com. Register today. We'll see you at the conference. Oh.